have an awesome exclusive interview keynote for you coming up, led by the one and only, we're abusing him and using him today, Natan Ponyman. Put your hands together, please, and welcome Natan Ponyman to the stage. Hello, everyone. And Doug, please, come join us. We're both in it together, so we can just, yeah. So, we have an interview with Simon and Doug Drizzle, who's the CEO. But if you want to introduce yourself first. Sure, hey, hi. Yeah, we're friends. We can sit yeah, closer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was doing the social distancing thing. So. No, we're good. All here. right. Well, look, thanks for having me today. Please. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm Doug Drysdale. I'm the CEO of Cybin. Uh, my background is I've been in healthcare for a little over 30 years. And uh, the last 50% of that as the CEO of four different pharmaceutical companies. Uh, I joined Cybin in the summer of 2020, uh, right, right in the run-up to us going public. And uh, the team has grown enormously. So what we're doing at Cybin is we're developing, we're engineering psychedelic molecules into prescription therapeutics for depression, anxiety disorders, and addictions. And we're doing that by, uh, by creating derivatives and analogs of well-known classical psychedelics like, like psilocybin and, uh, and DMT. And um, we're doing that in four different countries now. It's incredible how much the team has grown. So yeah. we're headquartered in Toronto. Uh, we have a lab in the Boston area where we do a lot of our chemistry, our initial chemistry. We have operations in the UK uh, and in Ireland uh, as well. Uh, the team's about 60 people at this point. Uh, the R&D group uh, has about 400 years of collective <laughs> drug development experience, yeah. uh, which, which, which is great. So it's four people that are 100 Four years people that are 100 years old, okay. yeah. Um, and uh, you know, at this point, this team has, has ushered more than 60 drugs through the FDA. So, uh, Amazing. And, uh, yeah. and we're public, we're, we're traded on the New York Exchange in Canada and on the New York Stock Exchange uh, under the symbol CYBM. Yeah, I was curious, how did you get the New York Stock Exchange to list you as a psychedelics company? Because you're the only psychedelics company there. It's true, we are. There are companies also listed on the NASDAQ. Yes. Now. It, you know, it's, it's a process, and at the time we went public, uh, we met the criteria for the New York Stock Exchange a little more easily than the NASDAQ. And, and quite honestly, at that time, the NASDAQ was a little volatile. There's so many tech stocks on the NASDAQ that it's a bit up and down. And, uh, and we liked the, the, the little bit less volatility of the, of the uh, NYSE. Well, yeah, nice choice. Okay, so there are a lot of, psych well, there are some psychedelic compounds that have had, you know, decades, decades of, uh, you know, research, proven efficacy, or at least not in the eyes of the FDA yet, but, but you know, anecdotally and, and for a lot of scientists, they have proven efficacy, and these are the classic psychedelics, you know, your LSD, psilocybin, DMT, mescaline. So why is it that you're investing so much effort and capital into researching second class or second generation psychedelics rather than, you know, just the, the first? Second generation, first class, hopefully. Yeah. Um, yeah, look, I mean, you're, you're right. You're exactly right that we have decades of information and knowledge about classical psychedelics. We know about the chemistry, their metabolism, their toxicology. We know how they behave. Um, so we're seeing lots of evidence of, of, of efficacy, uh, but there are also limitations. Now, most people here probably know that psilocybin is very long acting. Yes. So six or eight hours for a treatment session. Uh, maybe it takes 90 minutes to get to peak effect. That's a long time. In orally, right? Yeah, or orally, yeah. 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 So that's, uh, that's a really long time to be in a clinical, clinical setting. Uh, and, that, and that's fairly obvious. But what a lot of people may not know is that psilocybin is also highly variable. Uh, it's a prodrug, right? So it's right. not active itself. It's converted to psilocin in the body. Yes. And that metabolism from psilocybin to psilocin uh, varies enormously. Um, you might have a mild effect. I might have a very profound effect. So it's that, that has to do with how each individual metabolizes the, the pro-drug into, into exactly. the Exactly. Our, our liver mechanisms are, are, are individual yeah. and, and they're different. So that means that the, the, the responses are quite unpredictable. And in a clinical setting, that's not a, not a good thing. Um, that could have implications exactly. on efficacy and it could have implications on, on safety. Uh, you know, we've seen in, in uh, really quite enormous variability when we look at these psilocybin in, in animal models. So 
if you could create a drug that was uh, faster onset, shorter in duration, a little more, more manageable, and less variable, more, more predictable, then we think that's worth, uh, worth investing in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, and the market is going to decide on its own. I mean, if you have something that is better, that it just works better, has improved therapeutic profile and less side effects, um, and it's at a, at a similar price point or is covered by insurance, it's just a no-brainer, so. And, and that's a good point. I mean, uh, people forget about insurance and reimbursement, uh, and that's a big part of patient access. If you have very, very long treatment sessions or you have excessive amounts of psychotherapy and you're adding all these system costs to the treatment, then that makes you know, reimbursement a little harder. So something that is shorter, more manageable, uh, better for patient turnaround within, frankly, these clinics are businesses, aren't they? So they've got, they've got a turnover patients. Just, uh, it just helps these treatments become more scalable. Yeah, yeah exactly. So how does your pipeline look like? What were the main you know, flagship drugs that you're developing, uh, if you want to tell us about those. Sure, so uh, two main ones are CYB3 and CYB4, <laughs> really catchy names. Yes. <coughs> CYB3 is a deuterated analog of psilocybin. Uh, we've, uh, we published some preclinical data last November, and uh, what we saw with CYB3 is that the onset of effect uh, is about twice as fast. So in our, in our preclinical models, uh, the, on the peak effect is at about 30 minutes, uh, and it's oral. And, and then the duration looks to be in the two and a half to three hour range. Uh, of course, again, in, the, in these preclinical models. We also saw that really importantly is that at the peak times for psilocybin, so at that one to two hour time point, um, <clears throat> CYB3 was 80% less variable. So we saw these really big ranges of data for, for psilocybin and very tight data points for, for CYB3. Mm. Um, the other benefit of deuteration as well is that it helps... Can you, sorry, can you explain what it means to have a compound deuterated? Sure, sure. So for deuteration... The, for the layman's here. Yeah, I'm talking like everyone knows what I'm talking about. Yeah. Um, deuteration is the, uh, the process of substituting hydrogen atoms on the molecule uh, with deuterium, which is heavy hydrogen. And that has the effect of a few things, actually. It helps slow the breakdown of the molecule, but it also improves brain penetration and improves bioavailability as well. So uh, with, with CYB3, we saw a significant, a significant increase in brain penetration. And that's what you want. So it's more efficient, this molecule, at getting to the side of action. Mm. And so that might mean that we may see uh, psychedelic benefits, psychedelic effects at lower doses. Uh, so the same effect on lower doses. And lower doses could mean reduced side effects. Uh, about 30% of people experience nausea and headaches, transient headaches with, with psilocybin. The nausea can be pretty unpleasant, yeah. right? And, uh, and so if you can remove some of those risks as well, then you're improve, improving the patient experience. Yeah, and also if you have like a shorter duration of treatment, that makes it more easily available for people who yeah. maybe can't afford like to have a therapist and a psychiatrist and a nurse throughout a whole day, you know, just make it shorter, it's easier for people to access exactly, it. Exactly, exactly. And we're taking this, uh, this molecule, CYB3, into the clinic uh, this year. We're, we're in the process of putting our IND together mm. for the FDA right now, so uh, we'll file our IND this quarter. Mm. And we'll start a study in major depressive disorder around mid-year. Uh, and we'll be looking, interestingly, we're going to be looking at the effects of one dose or two doses. Okay. And I don't think that's been done before in a larger study. And uh, the reason for that is when we go back and look at some of the most impressive academic studies out of Johns Hopkins and NYU, um, they, the ones with the greatest effect sizes and the greatest durability use more than one, one dose. So in our study, patients will receive either placebo or CYB3 at the outset. We'll measure their response and remission at week three. And at that time, every patient will receive CYB3. So some people will be getting their first dose and some people will get their second dose. And at week six, we'll see, we'll be tracking again, response and remission, looking at the difference between one or two doses. You know, in our mind, the real paradigm shift with psychedelics is not just the efficacy, it's about that durable effect. And right. if we can maximize the dosing regimen to get a maximal dur duration of effect, <clears throat> then I think you've got a treatment that's you know, very, not only very uh, attractive, but also very cost-effective uh, as well. So, so how does your timeline look like in terms of, you know, your IND meeting and then your first phase one? Yeah, so we will, we're moving straight into patients, so we'll file the IND this, uh, this quarter. 
will start around mid-year, uh, getting the study up and running. We should have some interim uh, PK and safety data by year end, mm -hmm. and then the study will read out uh, in early 2023. Great. And what does your IP uh, look like, like your, your molding strategy uh, around this molecule? Yes, uh, so we filed, we have three families of patents that we've been filing, um, adding to the tryptamine family of patents, which is, covers DMT and, and psilocybin. Uh, we've got a, a number of patents around our phenethylene programs, uh, a number of patents we filed also around uh, delivery mechanisms like inhalation, uh, which, uh, which brings me to CYB4, which is yes. our, our other molecule. Uh, and that's one uh, for that molecule, CYB4, which is deuterated DMT. We were just issued a composition of matter patent uh, in February for that molecule. Uh, so that's the first one that's been issued, and we expect others to, to issue over the course of this year. Great. So do you want to tell us more about uh, CIB4 and you know, what are the benefits there uh, compared to DMT? You know, CYB4 is very interesting. Uh, so it's a deuterated version of DMT. Now, DMT, as you know, if you dose DMT, uh, either nasally or uh, inject it, uh, it's a very rapid onset. Yeah. Um, patients are in essentially another realm within seconds. It's very fast, quite aggressive, and yeah. can cause anxiety, can cause some people to be disoriented. Um, it's also a very short experience, six to 10 minutes if given that way. And <clears throat> our view, again, coming back to durability of, of effect, our view is that perhaps that's a little short to get a really robust duration. Nobody wants to come back and have a DMT experience every week, no. right? So let's, let's not do that. Um, and so by using the duration to slow the breakdown of DMT in the body, we've extended out CYP4 to about 30 minutes. That's what it looks like in our preclinical models. Mm -hmm. So that means that a patient can be in the clinic, uh, fully recovered and back out again within an hour which uh, we think is very scalable yeah. and very attractive. We've also combined uh, the molecule with an inhalation platform. Uh, it's a nebulizer platform uh, because you can't take DMT uh, orally. And uh, right. we've shown that that is very controllable. So we may be able to smooth that onset of effects so it's not quite so aggressive. And uh, we'll have quite a lot of flexibility around dosing, whether we can extend that for further or have multiple breaths. Uh, but so far with a single breath, we're seeing about a three times duration compared to DMT. And do you want to explain why DMT can't be taken orally? Yeah, it's just not already bioavailable. It just doesn't absorb uh, and, and isn't, isn't, uh, isn't available uh, that way to get, to, yeah. you can't get it to kind of get into the brain. Um, and so you typically would have to give it IV or... or yeah, or like in ayahuasca when you mix it with other in enzymes that allow it to be... So that's exactly true. and. Uh, so really the deuteration has the same effect as ayahuasca. Okay. Uh, it's a monoamine oxidase inhibitor in, in that. But rather than extend out for two to six hours, uh, this is just about 30 minutes. So this is something that I'm always wondering in terms of serotonergic psychedelics that act upon the same receptor. Um, aside from the duration of effect, what other effects are you finding? Like if you have a shorter version of psilocybin and a longer version of DMT, how will they be specifically different? Is that something that we know or not? not yeah, I, I don't think it's some, th something that we know yet. Um, and part of the reason that we're developing a portfolio of products is that people react to these treatments differently. Right. Uh, mental health disorders differ between individuals. It's hard to draw hard lines between some of these mental health conditions. And there's a lot of comorbidity. So plenty of patients that have anxiety, about 80% of them, also have depression. And so a portfolio of treatments, in our view, will enable a physician to tailor the treatment to, to the patient. And mm -hmm. we'll learn more about those effects as we get through clinical studies. Wonderful. And you have a new compound that you've recently announced, or are you, are you ready to speak about that? CIB05, or should we leave it for yeah, the next interview? Yeah, we could. CYB5, uh, it's, so this is an interesting molecule. It's a phenethylamine, so it's in the same category as MDMA. Uh, it's a really broad category of molecules, so yeah. this is more uh, tryptamine like in its behavior. Um, this is interesting, but not for psychiatry disorders. Uh, so it looks like at quite low doses, so sub psychedelic doses, it has anti inflammatory benefit. Mm. Um, so, so it could be useful in neuro, neuroinflammation, which 
may impact uh, Parkinson's disease or Alzheimer's disease or MS. Uh, so that's that's a molecule that we're likely to partner uh, with another another company that's not focused on to develop. Yeah. And but this would this be taken at home or in the context of? I would think so, and yeah. chronically most likely. <clears throat> right now, it looks like. It looks like you could maybe dose it weekly or, or, or once every couple of weeks yeah. as, as well. But, but it would be not psychedelic, so likely at home. Yeah. Great. So going back to your psychedelic molecules, uh, th there's a whole ecosystem of protocols you know, that you need to use to apply these drugs in a safe environment. So you have some work into that. Do you want to tell us about you know, the protocols that you've been working yeah. on your molecules? So there's two other uh, investigator studies that we're doing that are, that are interesting. One is at the University of Washington uh, and uh, in Seattle. And we're running a study there in healthcare workers. So it's th 30 healthcare workers uh, that we're studying that have burnout or depression, largely from this COVID environment for the last few years. And we're, we're studying psilocybin in, in that study, uh, but we're also combining it with our psychotherapy program, which is called Embark. Mm. And uh, the reason for that is to try to test and optimize what the psychological support should look like. When we go back and look at all of the psychedelic studies that have been performed, <clears throat> those that have used some form of psychotherapy or psychological support have better outcomes than those that do not. Um, but we also don't wanna have 70, 80 hours of therapy. That's not, <laughs> you know, that's not gonna be practical either. So part of, uh, in parallel with developing treatments, we're trying to optimize the psychotherapy. And then finally, and one other final thing is uh, the study that we're performing um, with our partner, Colonel. Yes. And uh, this is a neuroimaging study that I uh, expect we'll have some results on pretty quickly in the next uh, week, few weeks or so. And this is a miniaturized device, and it uses um, functional near infrared spectroscopy in a pulsed way. So, this is technology that's been used quite commonly uh, to measure uh, hemodynamics but this is a, in a much more powerful way, firing into the, into the brain at about 200 times a second in a wearable helmet that looks a bit like a, a bicycle helmet. Yeah, 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 it's amazing. It is kind of cool to look Nobody at. Nobody technology. Um, but what we're starting to see now is that we can, we can detect neuroplasticity. And because it's um, just a helmet and not a big fMRI machine, we can do that on a frequent basis. So I could have a patient put that on every day after their dosing in the study and to see what the neuroplasticity looks like and how it declines over time. So when we come back to thinking about drug development, we may be able to tailor our, our drug development to make that neuroplasticity extend or use the technology to predict how durable an effect might be uh, from say uh, psilocybin versus DMT. Uh, so we have some results I think coming in the next few weeks, which I think we pretty interesting. Yeah, I think it's very interesting to use that device I mean, if you think of a patient going through a psychedelic experience and trying to get that patient into an fMRI machine, that can feel pretty you know, invasive. So if you just have a like, very non-invasive device that you can use. Uh, 100, 110 decibels around your head in a metal tube while taking a psychedelic. I, not a good idea. I don't think it's a good idea. Good, wonderful. Okay, so any other developments? From your from your company that we are look, we should look for in the next. No, I, th I think we've got an exciting year coming up. Uh, it's fantastic to be moving CYB3 from the bench into the clinic. That uh -huh. uh, process has taken only about eighteen months, which is Very fast. at least twice as fast as you would see in traditional big pharma. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, to be moving into two human studies this year and really starting to get some some data from I think the, some of the first modified uh, modified psychedelic molecules. And uh, I know we get asked all the time, why bother waiting for second gen rather than just go with first gen? But you know, frankly, you know, if we can do better and we can uh, get access to more patients over the longer term, then it's worth spending the extra time to optimize the treatment and the therapy around it so that these treatments have the greatest chance of reimbursement because you know, it's all about patient access at the end of the day. Yeah, exactly. So if you have to look at the company 10, 20 years from now, are you looking at an exit strategy? What's your, your, your goal in the you know, medium to long term? Yeah, I don't think anybody's looking to exit at this point. Mm -hmm. you know, drug development takes a long time. Uh, we're certainly looking at major milestones along the way uh, this year that will continue to create value for shareholders. And uh, obviously at some point looking to raise additional capital to move into phase three studies. Uh, yeah. but, but it is a fairly glacial process. Uh, yeah, drug, drug development. It's slow, and for anxious investors, it's yeah, 
It is. It's slow. So, so it's like patience, you know, long term mentality. Yeah. And, yeah. and and that's another reason why I think having a portfolio of assets is important. Uh, right. De risks, I think, in the investment, but also you're getting milestones and catalysts from each of those programs uh, throughout exactly. throughout the year, not just waiting for for one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. getting the wheel moving. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Doug, thanks so much for your time. Thanks for having me. Thank Wonderful. you. Thanks.